racism, past and present. I'm the director of the city's library, arts and culture department, and your host, Gary Schaefer. We are delighted that you could join us this evening. First, some housekeeping. Uh, all participants, save for the panelists, have been automatically muted and their cameras have been turned off. Uh, this because we have such a large gathering. Additionally, per the flyer, community members were asked to submit questions in advance. So thank you to everyone who did submit questions. We will not be able to take any questions during the panel. This said, at the conclusion of the program, uh, you will have an opportunity to complete a survey. And as part of that survey, you may ask any questions you still have uh, so that they may be addressed at planned future events. I would now like to turn the microphone over to our mayor, Vrej Agajanian, who wishes to welcome you. Mayor. Good evening, and thank you so much for spending some time with us this evening. My name is Vrej Agajanian, and I am the mayor of Glendale. Today, we have an impressive panel of individuals with us to discuss racism, a topic that's not always easy to talk about, but incredibly important. A commitment to the dialogue process, open, thoughtful, focused, will help us make progress. Your presence here shows you want to better understand and help improve race relations in our community. And just being here is an important step. Thank you again to the panelists and our moderator who are sharing their time with us this evening. And thank you for all of you for joining us. I will turn it back to Gary Schaefer, Director of Libraries, Arts and Culture, to introduce our moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Racism, Black Lives Matter movement, and discussions of anti-racism have captured the attention of our community, the United States, and the world. It is important to the mayor, the city council members, and the city manager that we convene this panel this evening as the beginning of an effort to examine these issues. The community conversation is the starting point for an examination of Glendale's past and its present, along with planning for its future. And through this process, we will look to the community to gain a better understanding of what a safe, just, and inclusive community looks like for everyone in Glendale. We have already started our own historical examination and have staff combing through archive materials in order to better understand and document Glendale's racist past and put it in context of our region, state, and country. We plan to share our findings with the community once we have concluded our research. As an organization that serves the public, the city of Glendale has heeded its obligation to examine what role it may play in institutional racism and is committed to working to replace any semblance of a racist system with one that is anti-racist, which is one that opposes racism and actively promotes racial tolerance. This includes an examination of policies within every department, including the police department, something which is already underway. And I am excited to inform you that tonight's discussion is the start of a year-long series of educational programming around racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is sponsored by the city's Arts and Culture Commission and presented by the Library Arts and Culture Department. Additionally, I welcome the opportunity for our community to confront our past, understand our present, and move forward towards an anti-racist future. Now onto our panel all of whom are joining us from across the country this evening. I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator this evening, who I've known for 20 years. Uh, Dr. Stephen Nelson joins us this evening from Washington, D.C., where he is Dean of the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art. Dr. Nelson is also Professor Emeritus of African and African American Art History at UCLA, and until recently, he was the director of the UCLA African Studies Center a graduate of Harvard and Yale, he is the author of two forthcoming books, On the Underground Railroad and Structural Adjustment, Mapping Geography and the Visual Culture of Blackness. Dr. Nelson will do the honors of introducing our panelists. Stephen? 
Thank you, Gary. And um, it's great to be here and to see everyone. And welcome to this evening's panel. Um, I would also like to thank Hagab and everyone else who made tonight's event possible. Now let's introduce tonight's panelists. Our first panelist, Dr. Sophia Noble, joins us this evening from UCLA, my old home turf, where she is Associate Professor of Information Studies and serves as co-director of the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. She also holds appointments in African American Studies and Gender Studies at the university. Dr. Noble completed her undergraduate degree here in California at Fresno State and her master's as well as her PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She speaks nationally and internationally on the politics of commercial information, race, gender, and sexuality in the information technology professions, and, <clears throat> and she talks about technological redlining. She is author of the best-selling book, Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. Welcome, Sophia. Our next panelist joins us from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hannibal Johnson is a graduate of Harvard Law School and a member of the Federal 400 Years of African American History Commission. He is considered an expert on Tulsa's historic Greenwood District and the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, which has been referred to as the single worst incident of racial violence in American history. His new book, Black Wall Street 100, covers this topic as well as relate stories of what was then the wealthiest Amer African American community in the nation, prior to the massacre that is. Hannibal also writes on race and racism in Oklahoma and beyond, and has held teaching positions at the University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University, and the University of Tulsa College of Law. Welcome, Hannibal. Rounding out our panel is local historian Gary Kyes, who is joining us from the Glendale Central Library. Gary is a Southern California native and a retired professor, having taught at Glendale Community College and Pasadena City College. He was also a history teacher to many of our audience members, having taught at Crescentia Valley School, excuse me, Crescentia Valley High School for over 40 years. He is a graduate of UC Santa Barbara and Cal State LA. He is co-author of two books, Wicked Crescentia Valley and Murder and Mayhem in the Crescentia Valley. Welcome, Gary. So we're gonna go on with a series of questions for each panelist, and I will just start doing this now. Our first question from the community is for Sophia. It reads, racism is complicated. There is institutionalist systemic along with other forms. I do not believe I am a racist, but I'm picking up that this does not make me anti-racist. What is the difference between not being a racist and being anti-racist? And also what is institutional versus systemic racism? Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nelson, for that uh, warm introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of the panelists. And I just wanna say thank you for this opportunity to talk. These are the kinds of questions, quite frankly, that uh, many of us who work in higher education as faculty might teach in an introductory course on sociology or education, um, certainly in African-American studies or any ethnic studies department. And they're really, it's a very important question. It's, a, I think, and also a question that often people feel embarrassed to ask. So I'm glad that we're kicking it off with this uh, kind, these kinds of definitional uh, questions. So the first thing I would say is if we kind of think about um, systems of race, it's really important that we understand that the very concept of race is about a power hierarchy. Um, many people think of um, words like race and ethnicity and culture as interchangeable. And of course, tonight's an opportunity for us to maybe unpack the ways in which those words are not always um, uh, the same thing. So, in the context of um, systems of power, we would say and come to understand that the way that race has been um, structured 
and institutionalized. And for me, I would characterize kind of systemic and structural and institutional racism as, as really different ways of talking about the same thing, which is the institutions, the laws, the practices, the customs that get codified into our society that structure hierarchies of power based on, um, quite frankly, ethnicity um, in many ways, right? Sometimes uh, that can include phenotype, the way you look, the color of your skin, your features, um, but it's also the way that you're marked so that it isn't necessarily just about um, precisely what you look like, but the way in which systems code you. And of course, I come from the field of information studies, so we are very concerned with things like records and documentation and the way that something like your birth certificate codes you and defines you from the moment you're born into uh, a system and decides, quite frankly, um, what your place will be in the racial hierarchy by naming you as a particular race. Now, that's actually a little bit different than, let's say, my um, ethnic identity, which in my case is African American. And, you know, that really has nothing to do with biology. And this is another place where I think it's important to unpack this idea of race. Race is not our biology. Um, you know, in my case, I can tell you that. This is a conversation I've probably been having since I was about three years old because of the way that I look. Um, you know, my mother was in the in the kind of racial hierarchy. She would be defined as a white woman or a white American woman. My father, a black man, a black or African American man. So people often will say things to me like, "Well, then you're half and half, right?" In this bio biological construction, but of course, this is completely absurd. Because in no, no places in my life have I ever been misunderstood um, or misclassified as a white person. Okay, so I mean, it might be a bit a mystery for some, but I think for most other black people, they also look at me and understand and read me as a black person. So in my cultural experience, in my ethnicity, those that is where I would define myself as African American. And I think this is one of the really important ways that we kind of again understand. But in the systems that I engage with, when I check an employment um, application and it asks me to pick from a category, when I have a birth certificate, when I go to school for the first time and I'm five years old and I have to my parents have to declare a racial category. And those categories really determine so much about um, the spaces and places of, of opportunity and what we can occupy. And of course, one of the reasons that these categories exist is to, in fact, enforce the power hierarchy and to ensure that anyone, uh, that, the, that the goods and services of the society, that the power, the opportunity. So if, for example, we pass federal, state, or local legislation that prohibits colored people, black people, African-Americans, Latinos, others from participating in some form of the society, then those racial categories matter. And that is one of the ways that they get encoded. Now, when we talk about them institutionally, every dimension of modern life is governed by these racial categories, whether it's um, health, insurance, medicine, education, uh, finance, every every dimension of these categories that um, uh, are laden with power. And one of the things that's really important to understand is that no matter whether one thinks of themselves as not racist at an individual level, one will still inherit the disadvantage that is accrued to the categories that they exist within, and they will accrue the advantages whether or not they choose to act upon or receive or actively fill out an application saying, by the way, did you know I should get more power in the society because I'm a white American? Um, in fact, you don't ever have to name that. Um, by virtue of being an American, 
that might in fact signal. And of course we see every day in the media who the people in our country feel are the real Americans, right? Which are white Americans um, when we see these kinds of stories in the headlines. So I think it's very important for us to understand that we live in systems and it doesn't matter if you signed up for the system or not. Um, it doesn't matter if you personally declare yourself to not be racist, you may indeed benefit and be a beneficiary of, of long-term systemic institutional structural racism. And I think that the way in which we start to think about um, intervening upon that through anti-racist practices means that we actively work to dismantle these systems of oppression. That is different than something like being colorblind, which is to say, I don't see race or I don't see racism, which of course is very dangerous. And we can talk about that tonight as we go on. Um, to be anti-racist is to say, I see these systems, I see these laws, I see these customs, I see these practices. I actively work to dismantle and change those practices. Um, and I know that that's not a zero sum game that for others to have power and opportunity and um, uh, all the, the potential of their humanity to be unleashed and unlocked in our society and our cultures does not take away from me either. And I think this is a, a really important reason why anti-racism actually improves the quality of life for everyone, not just for the people who are oppressed. And this is one of the reasons why um, you know, we, we should all be engaged in anti-racist work. There's so much in your answer. That's such a great response. And, and what I really like about it is that you, you take it out of the realm of being completely personal, right? That we, we so often think of racism and race as personal. It's, it's a story of good actors and bad actors. And when we start talking about race, people get really nervous because they don't want to be considered a bad actor, right? Or a bad person. And it makes everyone really uncomfortable. But to sort of think about these things as systems and the ways in which institutions act upon one another is a way to start to think through and, and dismantle in a way that good actors and bad actors can't, in a way sort of thinking about race personally as well, instead of systematically protects the system. Right? And so we're all, we all start being really good people, but nothing changes. <laughs> and so, so I, I, I think that, that those distinctions are so important. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's actually a decent segue to Hannibal. Um, and, and I want to ask you, and, and please feel free to opine on what I just asked um, Sophia as well. Um, but this is localized and, and sort of about Glendale. And, and our, our community member asks, how can we as residents in Glendale, which is predominantly white and has a large Armenian population, but doesn't have a large population of BIPOC, this would be black, indigenous, people of color, combat race, racial inequality in schools, services, government agencies, et cetera. What personal actions can we take to be more inclusive? You know, I think one of the more important things that we don't talk enough about is curriculum. What we are taught in our schools um, really feeds into the systemic and structural racism that exists. We're, 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 we're taught a often, too often, a sanitized version of our history that's exclusive of people of color and exclusive of what I call hard history, difficult events in our past that we ignore at our own peril. In Tulsa, for example, the site of the worst racial violence in American history, the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, for years there was a conspiracy of silence around this history. What that silence did was in effect allow the wound to fester. And it and it perhaps permanently altered race relations going forward. So there is even today what I call a gulf of distrust between the black community and the white community. People in the black community understand that during this tragic event in 1921, 
the police department deputized members of the mob who murdered, looted, and burned down the successful Black business community, Black Wall Street. So that's something that people don't forget. And it, it, takes, it, it takes years and years and years of affirmative action, if you will, to even begin to bridge the divide between the races. So I would suggest that one concrete step that could be taken in the community is take that, take a look at the curriculum, particularly around history. See if it is inclusive of all, all people who played a part in the history. Um, as the late Professor Howard Zinn talked about, a people's history of the United States. That's what's been lacking for years and years and years. Um, I serve as education chair for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. One of the things that we're doing is working directly with the State Department of Education on curriculum, putting curriculum guides on our, on our website, working with the State Department to ensure that the history surrounding Black Wall Street and the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre is included on state mandated testing so that teachers have an added incentive to teach this history. So that there are there are a number of opportunities for just the ordinary citizen to make a real difference. We're all represented by somebody on a on a school board. We have influence uh, in that sphere. We have elected representatives at the local, state, and federal levels. We can work with them to address some of the disparities that we know exist across lines of race, ethnicity, and culture. Disparities in education, economics healthcare, criminal justice, and on and on and on. Every indicia of well-being in society, there are race-based disparities. I just want to mention a couple of other quick things um, based on the prior conversation. One of them is the notion of anti-Blackness. So we can talk about race and ethnicity and culture, but I think anti-Blackness is a specific thing it has specific relevance in America because of our legacy of slavery. And that's something that, that is in some ways separate and apart from a discussion of general racism. The, the other thing I, I sort of want to, uh, I think corroborate more than anything is just to use, use the term social construct when we talk about race. Race is is not real. It plays out in real ways, but it's not a real, certainly not a real biological thing. It's a creation. It's a creation for a particular purpose by a particular set of people. And you know, power is is the the ultimate dynamic when we're talking about race and racism. I also want to bring up the concept of internalized oppression. So when we live in a racist system, I'm, I'm black, but, but I know that I have to fight internalized oppression. I have to fight notions of my own inferiority. And that may seem a little odd to some, some of the people who are, who are listening to this, but I think it's, it's real and it's near universal. Yes, all of yes to all of that, and um, and and I'm really glad that you brought up anti-blackness um, because so often you know, many of us try to distinguish between between racism and anti-blackness, and and you know for me personally, seeing everything that has gone on um, with law enforcement and and the the slaughter of black people, that is not just you know, sort of abstract racism; that is anti-blackness. That is that is anti in action, and um, and I think that that it is absolutely right to think about that as a term that is a, is separate, but it is related to all of these other things. And in and it's fair to say, I think in the U.S. that it's at the root of a lot of these other things, right? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, could you, you know, Hannibal, could you say something just to really give, give our audience a brief overview of what happened in Tulsa in 1921? Because I think, you know, for a lot of people, the first time they heard of this is watching The Watchmen. 
earlier this year. You know, I know I'm a black person. I did not know about this until I was an adult. Um, and the government did nothing about it, didn't even acknowledge it until 1997. So yeah. if Absolutely. you could just give, you know, Dime Store, what, what happened? How, you know, how many people got killed? What was burned down? Let me give you just a quick quick overview. Yeah. I have to say that this did not, what happened in Tulsa in 1921 did not happen in a vacuum. It was a right. part of a series of events in American history. This right. period was often referred to by historians and sociologists as a nadir of race relations yep. in America, the low point of race relations in America. But what happened in Tulsa in 1921 comes on the heels of, for example, 1919. Summer and fall of 1919 were referred to as Red Summer. Red being a metaphorical reference for the blood that flowed in the streets from all these events that were called race riots. There were more often mob invasions by white vigilantes of, of black communities. So Tulsa was uh, sort of a tinderbox in 1921 because of the racial violence and trauma that was occurring all throughout the United States, because of the relative wealth of the black community called Black Wall Street, because of land lust, the, the desire to move black folks off their land to take the land for other industrial and railroad purposes. All these things made Tulsa sort of a tinderbox. And there was one newspaper called the Tulsa Tribune, a daily afternoon newspaper that published a series of incendiary inflammatory articles and editorials that really fomented hostility in the white community. Against that backdrop, there was an incident in an elevator involving two teenagers, a black boy, Dick Rowland, 19 years old, 17-year-old white girl, Sarah Page, who operated an elevator. On Memorial Day in 1921, which is May 30th, Dick Rowland, the boy, with shining shoes downtown, needed to use the restroom. All the facilities were segregated. He went over to the Drexel building, knowing that there was a facility for his use on the third floor. He boarded the elevator. Something happened that caused the elevator to jerk or to lurch. He bumped into the girl, Sarah Page. She began to scream. The elevator landed back in the lobby. Dick Rowland, frightened, ran from the elevator. Sarah Page, distraught, exited the elevator into the arms of a store clerk. He comforted her. She told him her story, which was a story of an assault on the elevator. That might have been the end of things had it not been for the intervention of the Tulsa Tribune. That newspaper, the next day on May 31st, 1921, published a story entitled Nab Negro, for attacking a girl in an elevator. It was a false narrative. It was fictitious. It was the story of an attempted rape in broad daylight in a public building in downtown Tulsa. As you might imagine, readers of the Tribune were alarmed. A large white mob gathered on the lawn of the courthouse. Dick Rowland, the boy, was being held in jail on the top floor of the courthouse. Now, the, the white girl ultimately refused to cooperate with prosecutors, recanted her original tale of an assault, but it was too late. There were rumors that the boy was going to be lynched. A group of several dozen black men marched down to the courthouse to protect him. Some of them were World War I veterans, had weapons, they knew how to use them. A white man tried to take a black man's gun. The gun discharged, and as one, one massacre survivor says, all hell broke loose after that. The violence lasted roughly 16 hours. In that span, somewhere between 100 and 300 people, most of them black, were killed. Hundreds more were wounded. At least 1,250 homes in the black community were destroyed, as were a number of businesses, churches, schools, and other establishments. Many black families were interned People of Japanese ancestry were interned during World War II. They were interned in encampments throughout the city during this period. And also many black families spent days, weeks, months living in tent cities set up by the Red Cross. Property damage conservatively estimated at the time was 1.5 to $2 million. Those are low ball estimates. And in today's money in present value, that translates into well above $25 million and damaging. That's kind of a thumbnail sketch of, of that story, which doesn't which does not end there. Uh, what's remarkable about this history is that the black community marshaled their forces and resources and began the rebuilding of the community even as the embers still smoldered. 
by 1942, there were more than 200 documented black owned and operated businesses back in Tulsa's historic Greenwood district. So the community rebounded even in the face of hostility after the massacre. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, Gary, I, I'd like to turn over to you. Um, there seems to be some questions as to whether Glendale was a sundown town. What constitutes a sundown town first? And would Glendale's history of racist and discriminatory practices qualify it as one? And I'm going to let you go there and then I'm going to come in with another half after you answer it. <clears throat> I want to comment on remarks made by my two panelists here. Okay. Ms. Noble, she talked about <clears throat> white privilege that a lot of whites aren't even aware of. The advantage they get in the, the system with the police, with education, with housing, all those are advantages that they occur. And in uh, Mr. Johnson, he made the point about knowing, knowing your history. That is probably the most important thing because people don't always know their history and we should always look for the dark side of American history because if we don't understand what has happened in the past, then we can't do anything about it in the future. A sundown city, uh, is a town where African Americans are not permitted after six or seven o'clock. I know as of 1968, the police in Glendale were still telling African Americans they couldn't be on the streets of Glendale. The, in regard to sundown cities, it's not just cities, there were counties that barred all African Americans. In the state of Idaho, it was a sundown state. In the 1890s, one third of the population of Idaho was Chinese American. They drove them all out of the state. The, you know, the, the term, one term is Anna. Uh, ain't no ends allowed. There's a little town in the Midwest, in Illinois. The town is Anna. That's where that phrase came from. You know, I said N, and it really doesn't tell you. You know, I don't want to use the derogatory term. You know, some some sundown cities had signs posted. Uh, no blacks after dark. Uh, some of them said, don't let the sun go down on your black ass. Signs. And in some cases, towns had a whistle that they blew at six to tell all African Americans to get out of town. I remember when I first started teaching here in Glendale in 1968, I lived in Downey and I drove down Verdugo and La Cañada every afternoon at 3.30 and I could see all the African-American maids standing at the bus stops, waiting for them to take them out of town. As I taught at Crescenta Valley High, which is North Glendale, uh, Foothill Boulevard connects two African-American communities, Altadena and Pacoima. And I had often see police stopping African-Americans to make sure they tried to avoid the community. That's where it gets really ridiculous. Uh, you know, some, some sundown cities did not allow African Americans in the community at all. And therefore, you, if you were going someplace, you had to detour around the town. I think where it got the worst is when you as an African American, your car broke down in a sundown city and you face the same kind of hostility. Nobody made any concessions that you were involved in a situation beyond your control. 
You know, there are some towns in the Midwest that did not sell gas to African Americans into this century, this century. Um, so yes, Glendale was a uh, sundown city. Burbank was a sundown city. In 1935, uh, there was a CCC group that was going to come into Glendale and Burbank and work, and they were African-American, and the city said, no, we can't have them. We cannot have African-American. Not even to do work that was valuable to the community. You know, this is all why uh, in 1964, the American Nazi Party established its headquarters in Glendale, because as George Lincoln Rockwell said, uh, Glendale is a white man's town. Wow. <laughs> um, and so the second part of that question, and, um, and I, I, you know, I'm going to ask Ashley all of you what you think of this. Um, how do sundown resolutions help city acknowledge, cities acknowledge their history and commit to moving forward? And do you all think that Glendale would benefit from such a resolution? And I will go to Gary first. Yes, I think a, a resolution of that kind would be important. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It put the community on, mm -hmm. on uh, account because they mm -hmm. have this history and they would be forced to admit it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's my answer there. Mm -hmm. um, Sophia, what do you think? This conversation is so fascinating to me because I <clears throat> was born and raised in Fresno, California in the San Joaquin Valley, which also is a place surrounded by sundown towns. Um, I can remember, you know, I'm not that old and um, although I feel it in my bones, I can remember, for example, my mom telling me that I had to leave Clovis, which is the adjacent city before the sun went down and growing up my whole life. Um, being very aware that there were places, in fact, even to this day, when my husband and I drive up and down the state of California, I'll point out to him the sundown towns because he's from Illinois and a small town in Illinois. And he's always pointed out this sundown towns in Illinois mm -hmm. when we've been there. And this is a really um, uh, painful and difficult reality that I think um, has to be acknowledged, of course. I mean, even today, you can talk about sundown towns and people don't know what that is if they don't grow up in these kinds of spaces or places. And, um, you know, so many ways, there are so many ways in which these practices remain about who belongs and who doesn't belong and the way in which we don't need the the signs, but we have the customs that still exist. Of course, every day there's a new viral video on the internet showing someone saying, you don't belong here. This is a gated community. You shouldn't be here. Um, you know, Trayvon Martin was murdered in a community by a neighborhood watch um, captain who decided he didn't belong um, in the space and place he occupied. And um, his murder, you know, was the birth of the modern civil rights movement of Black Lives Matter today. So we know that these um, traditions do not exist in a vacuum. They actually are a long historic practice. They actually even predate, um, you know, this idea of a sundown town is also tied to the um, lantern laws where black people who were enslaved, African peoples who were enslaved could not move from plantation to plantation without their papers. They had to have, they had to have a lantern to light their faces or they could not move about freely um, without risk of death. And so the many iterations by which these things um, happen um, must be acknowledged um, because they also get codified into all kinds of brand new um, practices about um, who belongs and, quite frankly, the high, high prices that people pay in terms of being murdered, being abused, being arrested, um, and so forth, uh, you know, today in 2020. So I think it's absolutely crucial that we acknowledge this. And, you know, of course, we can tie it to other kinds of um, 
you know, phrases that harken back to and call for a kind of old America that people, um, you know, fantasize about. But of course, that that idea of a vintage Americana that somehow was so much better really is is because people refuse to acknowledge what um, Professor Keyes is talking about, this dimension of the quote unquote good old days that are in fact the contemporary current days. And so we, we must acknowledge, we must educate. Yeah, yeah. that's a really good point. Um, Hannibal. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I do a lot of, I spend a lot of time thinking about the elusive concept of reconciliation. And, and I tell people that uh, there are three essential steps to move us farther along the road to reconciliation. The first is acknowledgement. The second is apology. And the third is atonement. Mm -hmm. So with respect to sundown towns and, and communities that have this kind of tortured history, certainly acknowledging that is, is a first mm -hmm. step. Saying, I'm sorry. I mean, when you know better, you do better. And then I, I guess the, the really nettlesome part is the, the, the third prong, which is atonement, making reparations, making amends. Mm -hmm. What do we do to repair the damage that we've done by imposing those kinds of systems? And there are a lot of things that we can do. Uh, some of them are monetary. Some of them are curricular. There are all sorts of things we can, we can do, but I think Acknowledgement is not enough. Apology is not enough. Acknowledgement and apology are not enough. We need all three steps, acknowledgement, apology, and atonement. Yeah, and, and I think it's really important to bear in mind and you know, before for us, for our audience, that so much of what our panelists are talking about, actually at this point, pretty much all of it, are not things that are that are written in law. So we're not going to find the law that said that all African Americans had to leave Glendale or Burbank or Clovis or wherever at sundown. That many of the, the practices we're talking about have been enshrined culturally and enforced as if they are laws. Um, and that's that's and that's part of the insidious nature of what what is happening. And, and 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 it shifts, and I think the example of um, Trayvon Martin is a perfect one because it's the same sort of movement, and it's just sort of adapted to a twenty first century form. Um, and so, so with that in mind, and I'm going to direct this at, at Sophia. Um, how do you think a city commits to ending systemic racism when you know in, in this kind of a context? where we have all these things that are still happening when we have sundown, sundown laws, redlining, and all of these other practices going on that, that are shady, but legal. Well, one of the things that I study in my own research at UCLA is the way in which these practices, these histories get encoded into new forms of technologies and decision making tools uh, or projects that um, make it very, very difficult to intervene upon these uh, systems. So that even if we are having these conversations and we're thinking about what it would mean to be um, living in and making um, anti-racist communities, we have things like, um, mortgage lenders and banks that are using the historical data of um, communities that have been, you know, successful, right? Or that have discriminated um, where property values have remained high, for example, as an indicator or a predictor of which communities will thrive in the future and um, which types of people are less likely or more likely to be successful with a variety of different kinds of financial and other kinds of um, products. So the question is, um, can we figure out how to uh, intervene upon these kinds of predictive analytics, for example, that get embraced by the communities, the cities, the states, 
the municipalities. Uh, and I'll give a very concrete example in Los Angeles. Um, we have, for example, a number of uh, law enforcement agencies that are taking up predictive policing. Here we have predictive policing is using data from the past of things like arrest records, the kinds of arrests that also include that you don't belong in a particular place or arrests that are about a predatory kind of um, management of communities of color and of poor people, um, practices of containment and control. And so the question is when we have many, many, many decades of these kinds of records that actually become the data to train machine learning algorithms that are used by law enforcement to predict where future crimes may, may take place and to deploy more law enforcement into poor black and brown communities, then you in fact reinforce all the kinds of atrocities of the, of the past um, where poor people and black people in particular have been over policed um, over controlled, disproportionately harmed by law enforcement. And then you put it into a system that gives a prediction score and makes all of these practices completely opaque. Just it, it's so difficult to intervene upon. And these are the kinds of reasons why we actually have to understand the histories of our communities, the kinds of records and data that go into predictive algorithms, because it really is insufficient to just say we want to have a proclamation about making an anti-racist system or community, but we don't even understand the mechanisms and the structures that are gonna maintain um, discrimination and oppression in our communities and in our societies. And these are really, really important, big questions we need to work on. I'm gonna follow up with, with you on this because um, one of our community members asked us about computer algorithms in Facebook and so, you know, and things like that. And so how do you, how do computer algorithms in Facebook or online recruiting services potentially promote, you know, promote or, or encourage racism and, um, and, make you pay more for insurance or food or, yeah. or you know, sure. any of those things? How do they do it? Well, there's so many different ways in which mm -hmm. our civil and human rights get um, jeopardized in mm -hmm. these large scale platforms. So let's just take one mm -hmm. social media uh, company, Facebook, but I really could talk about many, but we'll just mm -hmm. talk about one. Mm -hmm. People in the city of Glendale could do things, for example, like post an ad for a mother-in-law suite or an apartment above the garage or property that they're renting. And um, they can put very tight controls over the profile of the kind of person that they want to rent that property from them. And those um, controls might in fact be wholly discriminatory. discriminatory. They might be discriminating on the basis of um, you know, race, religion, ethnicity, uh, gender, sexuality, um, but the platform would actually allow you to do these things. Of course, this has been the um, subject matter now of federal investigation of Facebook um, and their ability to in enact and support mm -hmm. uh, discriminatory housing applications, mm -hmm. same for employment applications, these kinds of things mm -hmm. can happen. So of course, we people don't understand the ways in which these technologies get deployed and weaponized mm -hmm. against um, people and in favor of others. And, and, of, and of course, the evidence shows that these, um, these kinds of discriminatory practices are anti-Black. They are mm -hmm. targeted at Black people in the United States. And, um, and I think those are the kinds of things we need to care about. On the other dimension of it, these technologies are constantly extracting and studying and surveilling us. Mm -hmm. they, know, mm -hmm. they know more about us than, than, in fact, than your own spouse or your family members know about you. And what that means is that they can actually um, uh, keep you in contained um, spaces where you might be highly susceptible to propaganda, racist propaganda, disinformation, um, the algorithmic um, bolstering of some of the worst, most hateful kinds of content and propaganda is so profound in a place like Facebook mm -hmm. that um, people don't even know that they're being targeted for that and groomed for that. And of course, um, you know, films like The Great Hack 
uh, and studying things like Cambridge Analytica are, are, are great to help people understand this type of micro-targeting with racist content. Uh, unfortunately, people over the age of 50, 55 are most vulnerable to that kind of content. Um, and so these things are very dangerous. And in fact, yesterday there was a, a major hearing that the um, Judiciary Committee had bringing in uh, you know, for the most powerful tech companies in the world to try to interrogate them about the civil rights abuses, among other kinds of abuses that are happening in their platforms. And um, these are, of course, places where people now spend a tremendous amount of their time looking for information, news, and other types of resources, and where they are very likely to be encountering a lot of um, hateful propaganda, disinformation, or just um, uh, you know, misinformation and manipulation that might groom them to uh, quite extreme positions, racist positions. So then this is what you refer to as technological redlining, right? <laughs> yes, but, you yeah. know, technological redlining, or as mm -hmm. my colleague Chris Gilliard calls it, digital redlining, that's a little bit more about, like, taking um, mm -hmm. information about us and then using it to keep us from opportunity. Yes, so for sure in housing, mm -hmm. but it might be much more pernicious in things like the finance mm -hmm. sector, mortgage, small business, mm -hmm. loans, um, applicants to college, mm -hmm. um, real important factors that affect the quality of our lives. Right. Um, Hannibal, our next question is for you, um, and it's related to some of the things Sophia was just talking about. Um, we love our police department. They keep us safe and are super active in our community in very positive ways. Yet, across the country, we hear calls to defund the police. Who will keep gangs in check and keep pedestrians safe if we have no police? That's, um, that's, that's a really potent issue um, today. I happen to work fairly closely with the, the police here in, in in Tulsa, and the police have taken of late a number of, of important steps to sort of be more attuned to diversity, equity, inclusion, including including uh, training for, for new officers and specifically training focused on implicit bias. So that, that's really important. You know, I, I think, unfortunately, the language of funding the police is politically problematic. In other words, I don't have any data to confirm this, but my guess is that most people don't want actually to strip all the funding from the police. What, what most people are talking about when they use that phraseology is assigning some of the tasks that the police currently do to people with, with more expertise um, who could do the job better. For example, intervening with people who have mental health challenges and so forth. Is there someone else, some other agency that could do that better than the police? Free up the police to do what's really their bread and butter type job. I think that's what a lot of people mean when they talk about Defunding. I think it, when you use the word defunding, it, it, it's, a, it's really, um, it creates an opportunity for people who like the status quo to gain support, right? But I think if you use the, the, the nomenclature does matter. I think if we had clearer language around what it is we really want to do in the way of reform, it would be helpful in terms of creating the grassroots support that it takes to get these things done. Thank you for that. Um, Gary, one for you. Um, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I wanna, I wanna sort of go back to this for a second. And that is, did the Ku Klux Klan have offices in Glendale proper? And were there really Nazis in our community? Yes. <clears throat> yes, there were Nazis in our community. Uh, the Klan had a major presence in Glendale in the 1920s. I don't know if they ever, they must have had a headquarters because uh, in 1920, there was a major rally at Verdugo Park. Mm -hmm. About 3,000 Klansmen were there. 
plus many thousand bystanders. They march from there <clears throat> to uh, where Glendale College is <clears throat> at the excuse me <clears throat> present time and had an induction ceremony there. Uh, they burned a cross. At, during that time, during the 20s, the Klan uh, participated in Glendale parades and even had floats in, in those uh, parades. So yes, you know, when you're talking about 3,000 Klansmen, I don't know what the population of Glendale was in 1920, but it had to be 10, 20,000 people. So we're talking about a huge number of people. Um, the Klan has had activity through the years. 1936, uh, there was an incident at Glendale College. Uh, Pasadena City College and Glendale had uh, a championship football game. And after that, uh, Jackie Robinson was beaten up. It was beaten up uh, sufficiently to require hospitalization. Um, so we've had that kind of situation. You know, I, I believe Glendale has made a sincere effort to change its past. In the 1970s, I think was the, the last gasp of uh, the white community. There was an attempt to uh, create a uh, industrial park on the south side of Glendale, <clears throat> which would have bulldozed out the Mexican American population. Uh, that was defeated by the Human Relations Council and uh, a conservative group that didn't want any federal money used for that. Since that time, Glendale has had a much more open hand in re regard to its ra racial relationships. Oh, I just muted myself. Sorry. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is this is really terrific. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to go back to Hannibal for a moment. And a question from our audience reads, or from our community, excuse me, reads: The late John Lewis, whose funeral was today, referred to something he called "good trouble." Can you draw any parallels between the civil rights movement of the 1960s? and the protests of 2020. Can we learn anything from the 1960s that we can we can apply today? Have we made any progress? Wow. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So first, you know, I think it's always important to acknowledge that we have made some progress. Uh, it's in fits and starts. It's one step forward, two step back, it seems like. Um, there are lots of lessons that we can learn from the civil rights movement of the 60s, including uh, the centrality of having allies. It's not just about black people. Um, Dr. King talked about how we were tied together in a single garment of destiny, all that the rhetoric around uh, racial unity uh, and that we basically sink or swim together. All that is true. One of the things that's remarkable about the current Black Lives Matter movement is looking at the crowds in, in these various cities and seeing how diverse it really is and getting the sense that um, the white community has made some sort of exponential leap in a relatively, in, in historical terms, a relatively short period of time and sort of Getting, 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 getting to the point of understanding that our fates are inextricably intertwined, and that we need to address these structural systemic issues because it's in our, all of our self-interest, not just Black folks' self-interest. It's in all of our self-interest. And so, yeah, I think it's always important to to leverage history to the extent that we can, take the the, the lessons from our history. And apply them to the to the to the present to uh, address current challenges. One of the things that we want to do here in Tulsa, as we build Greenwood Rising, which will be a world class history center, 
is create a wonderful experience for our patrons where they learn the fundamentals of our history, but they are challenged at the end of the experience to use those learnings to begin to address current day issues, Black Lives Matter, mass incarceration, educational deficits, healthcare disparities, all this stuff is, is related. Part of the frustration for a lot of black folks, I think, um, is the fact that we keep, it, it seems that we have to keep fighting these same battles over and over and over and over. And that is, um, it's really taxing on the psyche. It's extremely taxing on the psyche. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to wonder, you know, every so often, why are we doing this again? Um, or why is this happening now? Um, I, Sophia, I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, what do you think? I mean, what kind of comparison would you draw between the 1960s or, or any period for that matter and what's happening today? Well, you know, I think that uh, today has been an interesting day of reflection about all the which all the different ways in which um, history could have moved forward. Um, partly because of the remark by former President Bill Clinton about John Lewis at his funeral today and suggesting that um, John Lewis hit and his parting of ways with Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Ture. Um, was the right decision that should have been made and was made. And of course, um, what a lot of people don't understand about a statement like that is that um, there, there have been many possible pathways to justice in our society. And of course, what many people argued for in the 1960s was um, structural change that wasn't really predicated upon um, notions of simply turning the other cheek and thinking about racism as an interpersonal kind of set of relationships where people could be made good people and then everything would be fine. Because of course, good people die and more people are born and we're born into the structures of the society that we're born into. And so we cannot simply rely upon being good people to make the kinds of change. And this is why this is the answer it, to me quite so it feels so obvious about why we over and over and over again are in the same conversations every decade. Um, this is also one of the reasons why the, I think in the current civil rights movement um, that uh, calls for things like defunding the police are actually abolitionist calls. They're calls for a reimagining of the way that we organize our society such that we put care, education, healthcare, housing, um, opportunity, employment, fair wages, labor protections um, in place in society structurally for everyone, especially for black people and oppressed people, poor people, because then you don't need so many police. That's actually what's underneath the call for defund the police. It's a way to pull people into the conversation if they really want to understand like, well, what is that? What in the world does that mean? Because of course we know we've had many, many social reforms since the 1960s and, and much earlier than that that um, don't result in the kinds of reform or social change that we necessarily think will happen. And I'll give you an example. I'm a professor in the UC system. I got my education, my undergraduate in the CSU system. I went to a public research university for graduate school. Um, we have fewer black students in the university today than we had in the 1980s. That's a fact. So how can that be? Well, it can be because we passed Proposition 209 uh, in the state of California, and we passed laws that would, in fact, roll back and reverse all the gains of the civil rights movement. And by law, those are the kinds of practices that, in fact, 
structure who gets to participate in the society or not. So this is where I think the day of John Lewis's funeral actually opens up an opportunity to say, you know, there were some pathways that were about um, the interpersonal love. And I'm not against that by any means. I love love. But I also think that we have to think about how that gets codified. And, you know, here John Lewis's legacy was about voter rights and fighting against voter suppression. That is really his true legacy in the legislature, in Congress. And yet um, here we are witnessing some of the greatest voter suppression that we've ever seen um, since Reconstruction. So I think we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to go about redistributing resources and opportunity? And the, the true calls right now, I think, are about redirecting resources from um, authoritarian practices of control and policing that, in fact, um, are not addressing the symptoms, the root cause, right? They, these are These are like, you know, making it so that middle class and affluent people don't have to see people experiencing homelessness or see people who have mental um, health crises or see people of color, um, uh, see black people, get them off the streets or out of your communities or out of your line of sight. Um, but that doesn't address the root cause of, um, of harm and disenfranchisement and oppression. And that, I think, is why, yeah, it might be a provocative kind of um, call, but I think what it does is it it helps us to then double click and say, okay, what, what, what are we talking about when we talk about that? And of course, I can tell you as a woman um, on this panel that um, all the police uh, and law enforcement investment hasn't stopped rape. It hasn't stopped the kind of violence that women experience in the home. It hasn't stopped all kinds of uh, violence against women in our society. So again, I don't know what, how we think that more of the same is going to solve the kinds of crises that are in front of us. And I think these are really, this is the moment where young people in particular, why we saw so many non-Black people in the streets is because People want to live in a different world that isn't um, marked by such profound inequality, such profound disparity. And of course, people in Los Angeles, we see that so clearly because we have some of the wealthiest people on the planet in Los Angeles and greater Los Angeles. And we also have some of the poorest people in the world. Thank you for that. Um, Gary, I would like you to chime in, chime in too. What do you, where do you, so to see these comparisons that these these sort of different moments. Well, <clears throat> we've talked about uh, missed opportunities. In 1866, we passed a Civil Rights Act. If we had enforced that act, we would be 100 years ahead in racial relationships. But the country did not have the will to carry through against all the opposition, the Klan violence, um, restricted voting, um, mm -hmm. you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, in reading about sundown cities, the author felt that there were three periods in American history, 1865 to 1890, where he said things were relatively good and you can argue that point, but that was his view. And then from 1890 to 1940, the country was at its mm -hmm. absolute worst. Um, he feels 1968 was the height of racist activity and viewpoint. And we were, were hopeful when President Obama was elected, we started talking about <laughs> post-racial America. <laughs> but I think what really happened there is white racists said, my God, how did we let that happen? And determined that it wasn't going to happen again. And then we got a president who continually fires, stokes the fires of racism 
and hatred in the United States to preserve his position in the country. So, you know, we, we've gone up and down in our re racial relations in this country. And hopefully, hopefully we're at a point where enough Americans are aware and want to do something about it. You know, I, taking the long view, I don't always see optimism. Um, after the Watts riot or rebellion, depending on what you want to call it, we had the Kerner report that talked about two Americas emerging, one white, one black, and what we could do about it. That report didn't say anything different than the Truman Report of 1948. And we didn't do anything in 48, and we didn't do anything in 1967. And then we got South Central in 92, and we have done little or nothing since that time. Mm -hmm. So hopefully this is a positive turning point. I'm not gonna put any money on it though. Oh, ouch. <laughs> um, so then, I mean, how do, I'm gonna start, I'll, Gary, I'm gonna stay with you for a second. Um, because the piece of this, you know, I keep sort of waffling back and forth, um, you know, myself and in conversations and, you know, in spending way too much time on social media and, and the like. And, and, you know, the thing that always comes up, and I think it's related to this piece of this conversation, are, are issues of implicit and explicit bias, right? Um, and how, how does that, A, relate to all of this stuff? And how do you feel that people can undo this? And I'm gonna, I, I would like all of you to chime, chime in on this. Um, or is, is that focus overblown? Um, and so Gary, why don't I start with you? Well, one one uh, remark in that regard. Um, I've read about hypocrisy in racial relationship, mm -hmm. and the author I read that from said that's a good thing because at least the people are willing to recognize that this is not appropriate. It's not appropriate to use that kind of language or act in that way. Um, Ninety-five percent of Americans believe in equal opportunity, not necessarily equal racial relations, but equal opportunity. And that, if it's true, is really a positive thing. The country, you know, says it's committed to equal opportunity. It doesn't always carry through. Um, but you know, it, the, the situation is that very few people are willing to express racial hostility, hostility or consciously de deny somebody something they're entitled to. But if, uh, if it happens to go against the minority group, they may not ne necessarily say anything in mm -hmm. defense or put themselves out there. Um, you know, I remember back in the 60s, one of the things that we tried to get across when our friends talked about the colors, we always ask, what color are you talking about? And that generally silenced them, whether they, they made any <laughs> difference to them or not, I don't know. Great, thank you. Um, Hannibal, what do you think? Absolutely, both um, explicit and implicit bias are, are, are real phenomena that need to be addressed. I do agree that um, many more people than in the past are attuned to this notion of explicit bias, um, and they, they understand that generally being explicitly biased would, would violate some some norms and they want to avoid that. Uh, implicit bias is a much more tricky thing. I found that working with groups, particularly I've done a fair amount of work with police officer groups, 
Um, when you raise the issue of implicit bias with, with, with law enforcement officers, um, one of the things that's helpful is to, is to say, which I believe to be true, that implicit bias is, is, is it's a universal phenomenon. It's not that other people don't have implicit bias. It's, 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 it's that it's the consequentiality of implicit bias when you're a police officer. You have the power to take a life uh, in, in a way that can't reasonably be operating off, off, off these, these implicit biases. So for me, um, developing a level of cultural competence is what's really important. That involves awareness, attitudes, knowledge, skill, something that can, can be, to some extent, taught. But we need to be looking at systems and policies that, for one thing, limit discretion so that, so that evaluative systems can be much more objective than they often are. The one perhaps best example of implicit bias um, that I know of is the simple resume experiment. You're probably familiar with it. Some of the viewers may be familiar with that as well. There was an experiment conducted whereby these resumes that were, for all intents and purposes, of equal caliber, except one resume bore the name Laquisha Washington. The other resume bore the name Emily Smith. They sent the resumes out for review. And the results were pretty um, surprising to some people. Uh, the, the, the resume labeled Emily Smith got 50% more favorable reviews than the LaQuisha Washington resume. Nothing really was different except the perception of the reviewer that one of the resumes was a black woman and one was a white woman. That's something we have to work on. That, that, that just cannot persist. Sophia, what do you think? Well, it's interesting in that last example, because of course, now, if you're applying to any, any type of sizable company that that those resumes are going to go through software and that software is going to sort you right out, even in the, um, you know, headlines. A couple of years ago, Amazon trying out this at scale because they have so many people applying for jobs and found that their resume sorting software sorted out 100% of the women and only sorted men in for consideration. So as you see these things taken to scale and automated, you know, it's profound um, in consequence and impact, disparate impact. So I find that it's difficult to talk about things like implicit bias because it really locates the um, onus of the problems purely at the level of the individual um, evaluator. And it really denies the power of the systems within which individuals are operating or the tools or the, the types of analyses that they're using to help them make those kinds of decisions, which in fact, one of the greatest misnomers is that somehow these technologies that we will use will take out the implicit bias. That's actually the logic that's used for things like um, uh, narrow AI uh, tools and software used for employment, housing, uh, you know, admissions, all kinds of other practices that are very consequential, again, in people's lives, whether you get a mortgage, a loan, um, and so forth. So I think that implicit bias is just too narrow a window through which or a lens to use. It's certainly helpful if we're in an, um, you know, a um, consciousness raising group where people have extremely low levels of literacy about and self reflexivity about themselves and how they see the world or how they see people who are not like them or how they have unexamined anti black sensibilities. Um, it's very helpful, but it's dangerous in in the way that it gets kind of weaponized as a neoliberal um, idea that then locates the source of all problems at the um, level of our unconscious thinking. Because if it's unconscious think thinking that motivates our actions, well, that's really hard to intervene upon. And that gives us a, a really powerful out called 
I didn't even know that I was doing that. So I find that to be a very thin and um, in some cases dangerous kind of um, point of view or, uh, or, or model to uptake as a way to enact social change. I think that when I read the research about implicit bias, it's really to help show how the unconscious ways in which we harbor racist ideologies by growing up in a society that, again, going back to my opening comments, privileges whiteness um, or people who have closest proximity to that over blackness, because when I talk about a racial hierarchy, that those are the two ends of the power system. Um, and everybody is who's not white and is not black is vying for more access to resources based on that hierarchy. And of course, we see this in California with some of the most famous um, legal cases, for example, of the you know, Japanese Americans, for example, petitioning for whiteness. Um, through the courts, wanting to be be marked and categorized as white in society because they are not black and they do not want to have the kind of disenfranchisement that black people have. We see this with all kinds of, uh, you know, throughout the kind of southwestern United States with Latinos also uh, petitioning the courts to be acknowledged and seen as white. Um, and those things are, they matter. They matter more than our unconscious, unexamined beliefs, because if our unconscious and unexamined beliefs don't have power tied to them, they're not particularly, you know, potent. Um, but when power is tied to them, they're extremely dangerous. And this is why I think it's like, you know, it might be opening to look at things like, you know, your own uh, uh, fragility right with certain kinds of conversations and why why because of maybe implicit biases but but after that we need to be talking about um how systems and societies are shaped and how power is meted out and that goes far beyond implicit bias to me yeah i couldn't agree with you more i'm <laughs> surely i because I, in in my mind and this you know goes back to some of the things that all of us have been talking about um, for the for the time we've been together, it's this balance between you know the system and dismantling a system and personal responsibility. And and I've seen in workplaces, and you know I worked for twenty years at UCLA, and so it's the, one of the examples I know best that we I we went to workshop after workshop after workshop on bias, especially in terms of hiring, hiring faculty, and things like this. And the question I would always ask is, this is all well and good, but how is that going to change who we hire? This is all well and good. If we sort of have a whole group of people of color coming through the door, how do we treat those people of color once they're in the door? And so are there other other, other fences put up for people once they're here? And this is the conversation. It's like, a, it's like a Hollywood romance. Everyone gets together and you don't know what happens 10 years later, right? Um, yeah. And yeah, go ahead. If I may, I mean, yeah. the problem is also that these ideas get framed in a zero sum game. Exactly. So I think five. this the challenge yeah. is that the yeah. question is if a if we only get to hire two people in our company or mm -hmm. in our department this year, who's it gonna be? Who are we gonna bet on? Because mm -hmm. if we don't hire X, someone else is disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is um very difficult. I mean, this is why I think it's important to think in terms of, well, you know, what if, what if we had a society and an economy where everybody who's qualified and wants to go to college gets to go? And that would also mean that we would need a lot of people to teach them. We would not be in a scarcity model. We would reimagine um, things like the prestige scores of what it means to get in this place and not in that place because all the places would be valuable and all the places mm -hmm. would be important and meaningful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is where we have to think in terms of paradigms. And, you know, I, because of the type of work that I do, I think about paradigms all the time because I have a very long view on technology. I don't work at just the like what's happening this year. 
So I think about things like when the paradigm was that the American economy could not exist without the enslavement of African peoples because the whole system would collapse if we did away with slavery as an institution. Well, that's a paradigm. I also think about things like, and I think about that, of course, in relationship to our obsessive um, you know, beliefs that we can't reimagine the contemporary moment that we live in. But see, it was people who were abolitionists who did the paradigm reimagining. And when you do paradigm reimagining, you can actually move the society to a different place. And I think that is very exciting and wonderful and actually doesn't have to be predicated upon exclusion and a zero sum game and that um, to give to and make whole communities that have been typically oppressed, that means somehow someone else is diminished. I mean, I don't know. I guess if you go from having $300 billion to $1 billion, are you really harmed? I mean, these are the kinds of questions about the economic distribution in our societies in the world. And we're in a crisis moment where we really can't afford to not start talking and imagining in new paradigms. And it, I think, you know, I really appreciate um, Professor Key's, um, you know, work as a historian, because I think one of the things that we're doing, of course, um, you know, uh, uh, this legacy of Tulsa is so important because it's the model for doing reimagining and working and and um, not being shut down by oppression and being able to still be creative in the face of very, very difficult, painful realities. And that is exactly what we're living in right now. And I think this is why we need this, these histories and these models up, put up for us. So we're also not defeated by racism and not defeated by economic inequality, but we find power in and strength in how people have um, ta tackled it and brought us to today. That's terrific. Yes. Um, you know, this this also the one thing I want to bring up before we run out of time is the issue of allyship. And um, because we hear it, you know, especially now, we hear a lot about allyship and what it means to be an ally. And I think a lot of the people who may be seeing us tonight are, are concerned with those kinds of an issue. And so I'll start by way of a, a specific a specific question and it was actually directed for Sophia um, but I would like to hear sort of perhaps open up a larger conversation before we all have to go about allyship and what it means um, but the the particular question is how can Glendale's Armenian community which has recently emigrated over the last half century in various waves be included in the coalition to eliminate racism against black and Af people of African descent. What would be useful and appealing to this group, which is struggling with its own discrimination and working hard to, to achieve the American dream for itself? So, Sophie, I'll start with you, and I'm going to have our other panelists chime in afterwards. I'll keep it short. I yeah. We all have um, come from communities that have experienced a range of atrocities and certainly in the Armenian mm -hmm. genocide, uh, you know, is an important history that has to continue to be taught uh, and that people can understand. And one of the reasons why we teach about the Holocaust uh, uh, fate that, that indigenous people faced mm -hmm. and continue to face the Holocaust of the transatlantic mm -hmm. slave trade, um, other types of um, deeply wounding, um, profound, massacres um, and harms is so that we find common humanity and relationship um, and solidarities. So I think of, you know, um, a word like solidarity as being so much more valuable than allyship, mm -hmm. if only because it helps mm -hmm. us locate concretely in our own histories, mm -hmm. the shared desires for the kinds of societies that we want to live in. And again, those don't come, our freedom, it hinges on one another. Our freedom doesn't come at the expense of others. It's not truly free. So solidarity is a way that helps us understand that um, um, when you recognize my genocide and my harms, then you have the space 
emotionally, psychically, and otherwise um, to recognize how others are harmed. And of course, this is where um, I think we we have um, work to do. Um, and that includes all kinds, not just racial and ethnic solidarities, but class solidarities, um, you know, understanding uh, the increasing global wealth inequality that is happening before our eyes. And of course, that our, our very existence, our, our existential, you know, human threat to the planet is so tied to the economic crises um, in the world. So I think there's a lot of a room and opportunity. Um, Gary, what do you, what, what do you think about this? I think one of the major things is, you know, we're, we're talking about black lives matter, but it's everybody, you know, sundown cities excluded Jews too. Some of them excluded Catholics. Um, you know, in regard to the Armenian population, yes. They, they have suffered terribly. They should be aware of that, plus their relationship to the entire community. Um, I remember in 1965 working again, working for the Rumford um, Fair Housing Act mm -hmm. and going door to door and finding an Italian family that was in favor of discriminating against African-Americans and housing. And I had a long conversation about it with them. Uh, and finally, you know, they seemed to realize that yes, Italian-Americans had faced discrimination mm -hmm. and hostility. And uh, the one thing that I was proud of, that was at Santa Barbara at that time, we won our districts around the university, but uh, the, Fair Housing Act went down two to one in the state. But uh, again, you know, understanding yourself, the pain you've gone through, your people have gone through, and connecting with others. That's what's really great about our current situation. Everybody seems to be on the same page, you know, the mothers in, in Portland who uh, put themselves on the line to protect demonstrators. And all we can hope for is that there is a strong majority to move the country forward. Cannibal. Yes. Um, so, the, the first thing I think about is uh, historical, racial, ethnic, and cultural trauma, which is shared by a, a number of different demographic groups. That's something we have in common, something we don't deal with very well. Um, I think it's really fundamentally important that we develop the capacity to listen to one another's stories, that we develop empathy. I, I think of, um, a fellow named Martin Niemöller was, was a pastor in the German Confessing Church in World War uh, II. And there's a little poem by Niemöller that I think really encapsulates what we're talking about. And he, and he said simply, first they came for the communist. I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialist. I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist. I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for. And that to me fairly encapsulates this notion of mm -hmm. allyship and solidarity, whatever, whatever we want to label, that we're all in this together, that it's important that we support one another and we struggle ultimately for justice. Mm -hmm. So then, so then, building on that, perhaps you know, I, I, I'm 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 struck by the term you used a bit earlier, Hannibal, um, cultural competence, and and I wonder if perhaps we put more emphasis on things like you know, sort of overcoming implicit bias or explicit bias. 
then perhaps we should and and sort of pay too little attention to cultural competence, which in in a way is is a really good way perhaps to build empathy because a lot of a lot of what we're talking about is empathy, right? Which is different from love wins over everything, which is different from being a heroic ally. It's sort of you know, this notion that we are all in this together and we can, you know, we can walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. Um, and and I wonder if that's what what how can we sort of move from there in the few minutes we have left, how can we move from that sort of a stance to actually reimagining reimagining American culture? There's so much work. There's so much work to be, to, to be done, and that's a huge, huge question. Yep. Um, part of part of the issue is that uh, the, the challenges that we're talking about are, are chronic. Um, there are successive generations being born. We don't do a good good job of educating people just generally. Um, many people are still miseducated. Mm -hmm. We have a core of roughly what thirty five percent of our populace. Who in the current in the upcoming election are likely to support uh, the, the the current president, um, whose views on these issues are not advanced, I would say. Um, so we have a huge challenge ahead of us that begins, I think, ultimately with with education, with owning our own history, uh, with uh, re-educating in many cases a large swath of the population. Yeah. Sophia, what do you think? Well, you know, I think that it doesn't really matter how other people think until it starts affecting people negatively. So mm -hmm. maybe I'm a little bit less, uh, you know, I try to, as an educator, help my students understand that, um, you know, they can think anything they want to think and they can feel anything they want to feel. Mm -hmm. I really am less invested in their inner thoughts being, mm -hmm. you know, framed a particular way. What I want for my students is to for them to be powerful, critical thinkers, for them to recognize how systems work, where they fit into systems, where they want to change those systems, because uh, you know, at, right after Reconstruction, in the in the immediate decades, we had more black mayors in America than we've ever had in the United States, right? Since, and then we had the rise of Jim Crow and you know Night Riders, and um, we we have the protections that we have because we have laws that have made for those protections, and they are still not entirely strong enough. So I, for me, I find as a woman who still makes 60 cents on the dollar that my male counterparts make as a black woman who makes less than um, most in, in relative to my profession. Uh, when I look and I see, you know, black women and children, uh, the majority living, you know, below the poverty line, at least half, of the population, that is significant. And those things really have less to do with what's in our heart, what we think about people. Those have to do with the kinds of policies we enact when we go to vote, the kinds of people who are willing to run for office, the people who have the courage to stand up to um, other kinds of corporate uh, you know, control and lobbying, uh, lobbyists and PACs. I mean, so uh, what we need are, are like the handful of, of abolitionists who will run for office and make sure that the laws are fair and protect the public and that are they're in the public's interest. And of course, you know, if my neighbor hates me, I don't want that. And I don't want him to call the police on my husband and my child because they're out walking the dog. And, you know, those things worry me. And those are a matter of like what's in individual hearts and what's you know, part of the the logics that govern a person's moral code, um, their racism, 
quite frankly. Yeah, those things matter. Um, so I guess we need all of it. You know, we need we need a reckoning in many, many registers, I guess, is, is the point. And, and it's hard to say one thing before the other. But of course, some of these things impact millions of people's lives. And some of them are more relevant at the interpersonal level. The majority of white Americans don't interact with other people of color. They stay in their own enclaves. So, you know, I mean, what matters is the kinds of people they elect to make public policy because um, they may not be having a lot of contact with black people. Certainly the people I work with in the tech sector, a lot of them do not have a lot of interaction with black coworkers, for example, to be acting out upon. <laughs> you know what? I actually think that this is an amazing place to wrap this up. And I'm afraid that we are out of time for discussion this evening, but I wanna thank all of our panelists, Sophia, Hannibal and Gary for for being so generous with their time and so brilliant in their insights. Um, and I hope that you all learned as much as I did. And now I'm going to turn it back over to our library director, Gary Schaefer. Hello, <laughs> thank you very, very much, all of you. Um, a big round of applause, thank you to all of our panelists. I wish I could cue like a soundtrack of, uh, of applause because you were all uh, so amazing. And uh, thank you, Stephen, very much for leading us through uh, this evening in this conversation. Uh, I do also, because it came up in the conversation, I wanna share in case some of the, in the viewing audience don't know, um, but the Central Library houses a space called a uh, reflect space, and this has its genesis in the Armenian uh, genocide, um, but it really reflects on all social injustices um, from matters of uh, the Holocaust, Japanese internment, Korean comfort women, uh, incarceration nation was a great exhibit we had on uh, the prison industrial complex uh, and its uh, injustices towards primarily African-American males. Um, are just a sampling of some of the exhibits we've had. Um, that space will be going online uh, within the next few months, uh, if not the next month. Uh, so please uh, look for that online uh, while we are all sheltering at home. I also um, wanna apologize to any of our audience members if we were unable to get to your question. Um, there simply wasn't enough time uh, to address them all. Um, but this said, this is but the beginning of a year long conversation uh, here in Glendale. So hopefully we can get to some of your questions when we when we meet again. Um, please keep your eyes peeled and your ears tuned uh, for more on this very important topic from the city of Glendale, uh, the City Arts and Culture Commission, uh, and Glendale Library Arts and Culture. Uh, so I hope you all have a very enjoyable rest of your evening. And thank you again to everyone. And um, and good night. Take care, everyone.